Hello. I want to talk to you about a peculiar situation, a situation that occurs in Antarctica. Antarctica. I know, no one expects Antarctica. You see, life is the most incredible, amazing, super interesting thing the universe has done since the very first death of the very first star. Good job, universe. And the life found on Earth is richly complex in surprising ways. But that complexity isn't always found in the usual places. The Amazon rainforest, the African savanna, in the canopy of redwood forests, in the Mobile Tensaw River Delta. No, sometimes life's complexity shows up even in the coldest, least suspected places, even in Antarctica. Antarctica. I know, I know, no one expects Antarctica. But this is the story of how and why the crafty Antarctic amphipod abducts the innocent sea butterfly and forces it into chemical servitude. Just one tiny slice of complexity that we find in Antarctica. Antarctica. But first, let's understand the players here. What is an amphipod? Yeah, my name is uh, James McClintock. I'm the endowed university professor of polar and marine biology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Well, the Antarctic amphipod, Hyperiella dilatata, belongs to a family of amphipods called hyperid amphipods. It, it simply means that these amphipods tend to live up in the water column, swimming around, or living in association with things like jellyfish. Some of them ride on the backs of jellyfish. What they do to make a living uh, is they feed on plankton. And so these little amphipods will dart out and grab a little plant cell and consume it with their mouth parts. Uh, and maybe even capture a little tiny zooplankton organism that's swimming around and consume it. So they're kind of omnivorous. They eat little plants, they eat little tiny animals. So that's the amphipod. A fast living, jellyfish riding, mysterious pirate of the Antarctic seas. It doesn't sound like the sea butterfly has a chance. The innocent, graceful sea butterfly of the Antarctic is doomed to be a hostage of the amphipod. But before we get to the actual abduction, what is a sea butterfly? Well, uh, sea butterflies um, are little snails that have lost their shells. In one case, there's actually two families. There's one that have shells and there's one that doesn't. It's called a, a naked sea butterfly. And these naked sea butterflies uh, essentially uh, either feed on other sea butterflies some of them are carnivores that exclusively feed on another type of sea butterfly. Uh, or in the case of the butterfly that I worked with, they feed on plankton, small organisms that are in the water column. The largest sea butterfly I've ever seen in my life uh, was about an inch long. So most of the ones, the ones that I studied in Antarctica are on the order of maybe oh, half an inch at the largest. And that's the sea butterfly, an innocent bystander minding its own business in the water column until the amphipod arrives. In fact, one of the things that we did in the laboratory in Antarctica was to film sea butterflies being abducted by hyperid amphipods. So what would happen is a hyperid amphipod would sometimes make a mistake and they would grab a sea butterfly that was much too big to put on their back like a backpack. And they'd end up hanging on the end of the sea butterfly and the sea butterfly is flapping wildly and the little hyperid amphipod is getting drug along behind sort of desperately trying to you know get this thing onto its back. Most hyperid amphipods are really smart. They grab the right size sea butterfly and they roll it around on their back and they clip it on their back holding on with two of their appendages, they're called pariapods, and then they can swim around for weeks at a time carrying that little sea butterfly on their back. Sea butterflies that are being abducted aren't happy. They pull their wings in and they curl up in a little ball and they just, you know, kind of maintain that retracted position while they're being held and carried. Now that said, I think in the end sea butterflies are in fact released by these amphipods. I think that what happens is after a period of some weeks, the sea butterfly is released and a new sea butterfly is then replaced. That's all fine and dandy, but how do we know why the amphipod is abducting the sea butterfly? We did science. We collected these animals in the field, carrying butterflies on their back, brought them in the laboratory. We found a species of fish that we know is a potential predator of this amphipod. We took the little sea butterflies off the backs of amphipods and offered the amphipods to the fish. Every single time the fish ate the amphipod quite happily. But when we offered the fish the amphipod carrying a sea butterfly, 
In almost all instances, the fish took the amphipod with its little backpack and it spit it right back out. It did not taste good. And away went the little amphipod swimming happily with its little sea butterfly on its back. Now later on, we had a postdoctoral research fellow, a chemist, that actually worked with us and discovered the chemical in the sea butterfly that doesn't taste good to fish. And they described that compound and we named it pteroenone because taro refers to pteropod, which is the general group name for sea butterflies. Is there an advantage to, this, to the sea butterfly being carried? No, I think the sea butterfly is kind of getting the raw end of the deal. And you know what? I thought a lot about the fact that there really isn't a term in the English language to describe this relationship. You might be familiar with the term parasitism. You might be familiar with the term mutualism, where two organisms interact and they both benefit. You might be familiar with the term commensalism, where one organism is living in association with the other, but it doesn't cause it any benefit or any harm. This is kind of a, a very odd type of parasitism, if you will. But there's no living off the tissues of the organism you're associated with. Um, I think a new word could be coined uh, for this relationship. So the sea butterfly is the loser here, and the amphipod is the one that benefits. However, is there a cost to the amphipod? Using our video analysis, we, we demonstrated that amphipods that have a sea butterfly on their back are swimming slower and are less efficient at making turns than those that do not have a sea butterfly. And the reason that's important is because amphipods feed by capturing things that can be moving. So I think that there is a little bit of an expense that comes with abducting this, this sea butterfly to the amphipod. But clearly that expense is outweighed by the benefits of being defended from fish predators. If you went into the literature, you quickly realize that this was the first instance in nature on this planet that one species had been found to abduct another species and carry it around for its own defense. And the discovery is very unique. And I think what it says is that chemical relationships can be very complex. They can structure ecosystems. They can prevent predation of a species that's, that's very common, perhaps because of this relationship. And so it affects the whole ecosystem in that sense. There you have it, a story as old as time. Amphipod rides in on the back of a jellyfish. Amphipod sees a sea butterfly it likes. Amphipod steals sea butterfly and they all lived happily ever after. Why are they on the backs of jellyfish? Not all of them are, but many of them are. Well, there's various theories about this. The amphipods might be hitching a ride. Stick out their little thumbs and away they go. The amphipods may be using this as a platform to rest upon, sort of keep the energy levels down that they have to spend swimming, right? And then they dart out, grab a plankton, come back, and digest it sitting on the, on the bell. The other possibility is it's a, a rookery, if you will, a place where they gather to reproduce, raise families, almost a colony uh, uh, approach to why they're on jellyfish. Maybe it's protection. What do jellyfish have? Jellyfish have stinging cells uh, connected to their tentacles. And so perhaps by riding on the bell, fish are less likely to come and eat these amphipods because they know, of course, that there's this stinging element to the jellyfish. So the jury is out. Why do high parrot amphipods like to be on jellyfish? Nobody knows the full answer, but we know that they like to associate with these animals. <laughs>